welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of today's conference. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn your conference over to Mr. David Lamb. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Julie. And I want to uh, welcome everybody to the February uh, webinar in the East National Technology Support Center's webinar series for 2012. And I hope everybody's having a good day. We're having kind of a little dreary day here in Greensboro. So it's a good good opportunity to sit back and learn a little bit from uh, some, some experts that we're going to have on, on the program today. Uh, I want to go over a few housekeeping uh, issues before we get started. And to begin with, hopefully everybody's seen a list of all the upcoming 2012 uh, technology webinars that have been scheduled for this last Wednesday of the month series that we've been doing for the last several years. And as a way of reminder, if you're wondering how a topic such as our topic today or, or next month gets on the agenda, generally in the fall what we do is send out a solicitation to the 2,400-plus people that we have on our webinar series list and ask them for topics. Uh, or actually, we try and generate them. We gather topics throughout the year, and then we have people kind of vote on them as far as priority. So that's how we got today's topic along with the others. So if you're interested in something, you want to learn something, send uh, myself or uh, Holly Kirkendall an email, and we'd be glad to keep track of it, and maybe next year that we'll be able to get in on there. In addition to this one, we do have an organic webinar series, which is always the, se it's the second Tuesday in the even month. So the next one coming up will be on in April, and uh, you'll send out a notice on that. Um, in an effort to continue to expand our information base and educate people on conservation issues and what we do here at the Tech Center, we've started to participate in this Twitter account. So if you want to uh, follow us with Twitter, uh, we're, you can go to our link there and click on, and as an incentive to do that, we're giving away a CD with it called Gaining Grounds, and Kevin's going to talk a little bit more about that towards the end of his presentation. Uh, but to our first 10 uh, Twitter followers, if you sign up today to follow us on Twitter, uh, you'll be contacted, and we will uh, get your information, and we'll send you out a copy. This is a really uh, useful uh, do or, uh, CD. It's got farmer stories telling the stories of their success, not only with no-till, but success with their grazing. It's been uh, was done by the Virginia NRCS in partnership with a few other folks, and I'll let Kevin explain that. So if you're interested, go to Twitter. Uh, sign up to be a follower, and we'll follow up with you directly to get your air mailing information. Uh, as with all of our webinars, we do uh, make room to get uh, continuing education credits through for your CCA. Uh, what you need to do is download the form. Again, you look at the top of your toolbar, you should see what looks like a stack of paper, about two items left of the word feedback. Click on that, and you can download uh, the CCA form. It has today's information in it. You need to print your name, provide us your CCA number, and sign it, and email that back to Holly Kirkendall at gmb.usda.gov. Uh, you can fax it, but we appreciate you emailing. It makes our life simpler, and you will be able to we'll forward this information um, to the appropriate people to get your credits. You'll get one hour credit for today's presentation. And then, finally, uh, if you want to learn to uh, ask questions, as the operator said, we'll be taking audio questions at the end by hitting uh, star 1, and uh, you can provide your name and ask a question that way. But if you have a question and you want to take the time and type it into the Q&A as we're going through it, uh, I will uh, read these to Kevin and try and get a little more interaction going here and keep, uh, keep the question as close to the uh, point in the uh, presentation as possible. So, again... Click on the Q&A if you have a question. Okay, now to get to today's topic, which is essential principles for conservation planning on pasture, we have today's presenter is Kevin Ogles, who is the grazing land specialist with here at the East National Technology Support Center. Uh, Kevin has a long, outstanding career with NRCS, which included starting off as a soil conservation technician for five years in Michigan. He served as, for 10 years as a DC and as five years in Michigan as their state grazing specialist before coming down here about seven years ago uh, to Greensboro as the grazing uh, specialist here at the Tech Center. So with that, Kevin, we'll turn it over to you, and let's get your presentation up. 
There you go, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, David. Well, uh, glad to have everybody with us today. Uh, as the summary uh, notice that came out, uh, sent out by Holly Kirkendall uh, about today's presentation, uh, we're going to get back to the basics. Uh, that was a lot of the input that we got from um, our state grazing specialists of NRCS here in the East Region. And so Michael Hall and I um, took that information, put that out there as one of the topics uh, that people could choose from, and a lot of people chose this one. So uh, in trying to honor what the state grazing specialists uh, that wanted this uh, said to us, we're going to keep this very basic. So you may want to have a piece of paper and a calculator nearby, and uh, we're going to we're going to do a little bit of calculations. So in doing our planning, whether it's grazing lands or any other kind of uh, land use, we, of course, uh, use our nine steps of planning when we do that. And inventorying resources is a, is a very big one of those. Uh, we, we not only want to identify the resource concerns, but we want to be able to do an inventory, find out what's going on at that farm or ranch and then uh, also very important is to consider the the producer's objectives. Now, um, when when a producer asks us uh, questions, when we come out there, we sometimes have to use some some skill in uh, digging a little deeper to find out what what they're really after. And and sometimes that's not just the initial. Uh, well, I heard I could get some money. Um, you know, what can I do to to get that? So we need to dig a little deeper. After we uh, inventory the resources and we look at some of the solutions, uh, alternatives that uh, the land manager or livestock producer might consider, uh, then they make a decision and we write the plan. And that's, that's as far as we're going to go with, with our information here today, is just um, getting the information we need to be able to uh, write the plan. So we can do some pre-planning things. Uh, we can certainly take a look at a soils map and, and uh, figure out what the soils are and, and their production potential, including it's very important to know uh, if we have them, uh, the forage suitability groups uh, for any particular soil. Uh, that helps us with uh, production, species that we should um, encounter, uh, those that we desire, the desirable forage species. And so that, that would be real helpful. We definitely need to inventory what's there. If we, if we don't have forage suitability groups, try to get a handle on, on what is the potential uh, on that farm or ranch. So our goal is to manage pasture plants and soil in the most sustainable manner, given the land manager's objectives. So to reach our goals, uh, we use these tools. Now, we're going to be, uh, this, this is kind of the first in kicking off a series that we're going to do on uh, various topics in grazing. Uh, so some of these we've covered before, but we're going to be covering uh, some of these in detail. Fence, we need a barrier to keep those livestock in the area that, that we want them to be in. So uh, that's an essential tool that we need. Livestock is a tool. This is really hard for a lot of uh, producers. Obviously, they have to make money um, on the operation in order to uh, stay in business, and uh, we definitely want them to do that. But uh, the livestock really are a tool when we talk about sustaining the soil and the plants. And water. We, we've done a good uh, watering series in the past based on people's feedback, and so um, Michael Hall is going to look at that a little more when we kick off our series. And then managing nutrients. Uh, we One of the things we're going to talk about is grazing management impacts on soil and pasture health. And so managing nutrients is a big part of that. And so we'll talk about that in our series as well. But these are the tools that we use um, when we're trying to uh, assist that that landowner in meeting the objectives and also sustaining the resources. Some useful definitions uh, that we we should know. Stocking rate, that's simply the number of animals um, that belong to a particular unit 
and that's described in acres per animal unit or acres per animal. Carrying capacity. Uh, that, that has been used a lot by a lot of other um, organizations and some by our land-grant universities. And it's just trying to find a stocking rate that uh, meets the level of performance of the animals, but also maintains the integrity of the resource base. And of course, that's what NRCS is all about. We want to be able to maintain and sustain the resources. And so we call that the forage animal balance in our conservation practice called prescribed grazing. Stock density, we're not going to talk very much about that today, but that is simply the number of animals in uh, usually in live weight to a specific pasture area at a specific time period. And we'll talk a lot more about that in our series when we talk about grazing management. So an NRCS planner needs to know some basics to do a grazing plan. And what are these, these basic things we need to know? How much does each head of livestock need to eat per day in pounds? And we, we usually express that as dry matter. Uh, that's what all the information that comes out of our land-grant universities is, is put in, so we need to talk about that in dry matter. How much does each acre of pasture average in production? That can be a tough one. Um, if we don't have uh, forage suitability groups, if we don't have any past information, then uh, that can be uh, be hard to get at. We do have some information in our soil survey. Um, some of that information is good, and, and I've asked soil scientists, and, and several have admitted to me that that information sometimes is old and uh, may not be the most accurate. And uh, we can certainly talk to the, the producer. Uh, if they've made hay on those pasture acres uh, in the past, we can ask them, well, what kind of what kind of production did you get off those hay acres? And since that that's usually dry hay, so we're talking about that being a lot closer to the dry matter aspect that we're after. And then, how is that production distributed? That gets forgotten about sometimes uh, when we talk about uh, doing a grazing plan. It's not just how much pasture is produced, but when is it produced? And then what is that forage animal balance of that specific farm or ranch? It's very important for us to know that before we can go on and do some other things. Um, we also want to, to uh, make sure that uh, we use some good methods to try to determine the pasture production uh, while we're there. And we talk about that in our series also that we'll, we'll get into in depth about grazing management. So these are the, the basics we need to know. Now today, uh, from the National Ag Statistics Service, uh, we're going to use what they reported in 2007 was the last ag census. So these were reported by producers in the East Region of the United States. And most livestock operations are beef cow-calf operations in the Eastern U.S. Actually, in the whole United States, that's true. So today we'll just use the example that came out of these averages. Uh, the average herd size is 23 cows with an average pasture size of 41 acres. And we will say that the average mature beef cow will weigh about 1,200 pounds for our example discussion today. So we're going to do some grazers math and using these numbers. For intake rates, um, we're going to use 3% for a lactating beef cow. Now, this is probably a little higher than uh, uh, some grand universities would use. But uh, I'll say this several times today. We want to err on the side of being conservative. Uh, better to plan that we've got a little too much feed for those animals, and, and therefore we're being a little kinder uh, to those resources than the other way. So in this situation, getting to one of those core basic things we need to know, if the cow weighs 1,200 pounds and she consumes 3% of her body weight per day, then that would be 36 pounds of dry matter that she needs per day. So that'll, that'll be something we'll use later on. 
And we're going to say that the annual pasture production, this is about as close as I could get from what information I could get my hands on, is about three tons per acre. Now, that that's for cool season, grasses and legumes, and that's a, a mixed stand, and that's always how we usually find it out in nature. Uh, we rarely find uh, too many monocultures in cool season grass and legumes, although we have seen some tall fescue monocultures in pasture. So we're going to use this three tons per acre. Now that varies a lot by soil and the state climate that we're in. And so uh, here's another area where forage suitability groups will greatly help us. But we're going to use this three tons per acre for our discussion today. And then uh, keep in mind, how is that production distributed? Uh, Here's just an example. Here's showing the cow-calf demand line in, in uh, pounds uh, needed from the pasture. And then the green line is the cool season grass. The blue line, the red and white clover. So you can see their production. And so we get more than we need in the spring. Uh, and it really drops off when it begins to be hot and dry in the summertime. And we've had hot and dry spells uh, almost everywhere in the East region. They occur a little less in the northeast uh, than they do in some of the other places of the country, but even the northeast, uh, even in recent years, have, has experienced that also. If we can um, get equipment on the land, if it's not too steep, um, then sometimes we can harvest hay to feed during this hot, dry period where pasture production drops off, or sometimes we can use grazing management to uh, harvest uh, that fast-growing uh, yield and then um, maybe be able to kind of to hold that in check and as we get closer into that hot, dry summer. So the distribution is, is very different from, from the constant demand that, that our cow-calf pair need. So we need to know what is the forage animal balance. That's really going to drive everything. Uh, if we don't know what the forage animal balance is uh, during the grazing season, we certainly don't know um, whether that operation is overstocked or not. Um, and if it's overstocked, uh, by it doesn't take much overstocking to see overgrazing. And I'll show you a picture of that later. So to get a forage animal Balance balance simply means that the amount of supply is equal to the amount of the of demand. And so if that's true, then that would equal one. And for our purposes, uh, we like to be greater than one. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So when we talk about pasture supply and animal demand, we want that to be at least equal to one, if not greater. So when we talk about this forage animal balance, um, if they are out of balance, um, then we either have to increase the forage supply or decrease the animal demand. Decreasing animal demand is very hard for producers to do. Uh, for those of you that have done planting, you've ran into that. Uh, I've ran into that. Telling somebody they need to, to sell some animals, which the producer sees directly as decreasing their income is very hard to do. Um, we have to be able to determine what that forage supply is. Going back to earlier when I talked about there's many methods to do that, and we'll cover that in a grazing management in our series later on uh, this year. But uh, we have to be able to determine that by some means. And determining animal demand, we'll show you here in a second how we do that. So these are the four factors to determine a forage animal balance. We need the yearly forage production times the utilization rate that's going on by our management method out there. And then we divide that by our animal demand. And our animal demand factors are the herd intake per day times the length of the grazing season in days. You might want to Jot those down if uh, you're going to do some of the calculations with us today. Yearly forage production times utilization rate divided by herd intake per day times the length of the grazing season in days.
yearly forage production. It's the thing we're going to look at first. To get the yearly forage production, we're going to take that annual yield in pounds per acre times our total pasture acres. Now, in our example, we said that we were going to use three tons per acre. That's, of course, 6,000 pounds. And then we're going to take that times our uh, total pasture acres, which we said was 41 in our example. And then we're going to take that times the utilization rate. Utilization rate is so important. Uh, it, it is the key to being able to make sure our resources are uh, taken care of and, and being sustained. So the utilization rate, um, that's what, uh, why we need to do some management to affect that. Here's an old slide, but it just shows so true um, what we need to try to do. Here's some cool season grasses. Uh, we want to harvest uh, them when they're in the 6 to 12 inch stage, depending on the plant species, and stop uh, grazing them any longer once they get down to 3 or 4 inches. We don't want to take it lower than that or really begin to hurt the roots. And we will also talk about that in detail in our series later. But So, so we're talking about this area between the 6 to 12 inch height and the 3 to 4 inch height, depending on species. And, and utilizing that. So when you see these utilization figures, we're talking about this area in here. Okay, so utilization rates, uh, several land grant universities have done research on this, and this came out of University of Missouri, this particular chart. Then in continuous grazing, we're talking about animals being out there 24-7, 365 days a year. The utilization rate uh, of what's out there uh, is usually only about 30 percent. It can actually be a little lower than that. Um, and all kinds of things are affected when those plants are eaten right down as low as the, uh, the animal can get. And for our example today, we're using a beef cow. And uh, so it can, look, it can look almost like a, a, a golf course a fairway out there. And so um, the more days of grazing uh, or the, the less days of grazing period and the more days of rest, uh, the better the utilization rate. And so you see these climb and then an estimation by University of Missouri of how many pastures it would take. So let's, let's just look at uh, this three to five days of grazing. Uh, if there's eight pastures, then seven of the other pastures, which they wouldn't be grazing at the time, uh, those pastures ought to be able, to, if we did a five-day, those seven pastures ought to be able to get 35 days of rest for those plants at a, about a 50% utilization rate. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so we're, our tools, again, are so important. We're going to use the livestock to harvest these plants. We're going to use fence to determine how big an area they get. And the water is real important. Um, we're going to have to supply water to these animals if we want to increase the utilization rate. And we will talk about that again in our series in detail later this year. But uh, uh, we, we can certainly, um, you know, affect how much utilization goes on. I think we had a yeah, question well, come in, David. Yeah, a question came in, Kevin, and about this utilization rate and how much it varies throughout the gra grazing season. Is it pretty constant or does it vary that much? It, it all depends on our management. So if we manage well throughout the season, it can be very, very constant. If, if the management is uh, good management for part of the grazing season and not so good management later on, then the utilization rate will vary. And so in a continuous grazing system, it doesn't vary a whole lot because it's, it's not very much. And so that sounds like that maybe that's what they were asking. And if not, at the end, you can certainly uh, call in and we'll, we'll do our best to answer your question. Okay, now we're going to look at animal demand. Intake per day for the herd. Okay, to get that. Uh, then we take that times the length of the grazing season in days. Remember, we're going to use that 3% for a beef cow. And so here's our, uh, just reminding you of our condition again, is we're going to start out 
we've walked onto this farmer ranch and it's currently a continuous grazing operation, so we're going to use 30% for our utilization factor. 23 cows weighing 1,200 pounds, 41 acres at 6,000 pounds per acre. And we're going to say the grazing season is 210 days. I just picked one from north to south and uh, kind of tried to shoot in the middle there somewhere. So our yearly forage production to get that is 6,000 pounds per acre times our 41 acres is 246,000 pounds. That's our forage supply uh, or for the yearly production. But then we have to take that times our utilization rate. Okay, and we said that was 30%, so our pasture supply is 73,800 pounds. And that might be what uh, a continuous grazing operation looks like. This is a picture from North Carolina. So that, that's about 30% utilization. Some of the plants got away from them before they could be eaten, and when they get hard and stemmy, they won't, they won't eat them. And uh, some of the plants, uh, the second they grow, are being eaten off, just about. So, what's our intake per day for the herd? Percent intake of body weight per head per day in pounds times the number of head. So, 3% of 1,200 pounds is 36 pounds per day, and we had 23 cows. Now, you want to remember, uh, when you're out there doing planting, if there's a bull in the... the uh, the mix, then we need to account them. They eat too, and so we need to account for that. But today we'll just say they're doing artificial insemination or whatever, and uh, uh, they're using uh, that herd needs 828 pounds, okay, per day. And then we need to take that times the length of the grazing season in days. So we said we were going to use 210 days, so that gives us 173,880 pounds. Okay, now we got the information to calculate this forage animal balance, and wow, oh my, <laughs> we're we're way out of balance, aren't we? 0 0.005, pretty pretty far away from one. Um, and, and this was the average for the East Region. So what's that tell us? That that uh, and we knew that. Well, our, our grazing specialists know that too, that the majority of farms, uh, even though we've done a lot of great work on some farms, unfortunately still the majority are uh, uh, overstocked, okay? And so uh, what can we do about this? Well, we said we could either increase uh, pasture supply or decrease animal demand. Well, if that's all the pasture that someone has, uh, then then what are they what do they do? Well, they feed hay, right? And there's an expense to that. And uh, we had a, a webinar um, last year about the economics, and there's a high cost to feeding hay, uh, whether you buy it or whether you make it uh, on your own hay ground. There's still a high cost to that. Okay, this person says, well, okay, I, I want to do some rotational grazing. Uh, maybe that'll help me out. So everything stays the same. We're just going to change the utilization rate. Okay, same numbers as before, same farm. So we're we're going to have to design uh, eight pastures, three to five day grazing period to get that 50% utilization, which is pretty common for a beef cow calf operation. Uh, is if we can get 50% utilization, that that's pretty good. We realize that in if the average herd size is 23, even with today's uh, record high cattle prices and uh, wean calf price, um, we realize that that uh, nobody's going to make a living just selling 23 calves. And so um, rotating something every, once uh, every seven days uh, works good for a lot of people, but, but a few people will, will move them a uh, couple times uh, every seven to ten days or so. Okay, so 50% utilization might look uh, about like that. That's what uh, uh, this farm was. Okay, so okay, let's try this. Um, uh, for the livestock producer here said they wanted to try rotational grazing, so we did that. Well, we didn't get one, did we? But 
we got a lot closer than we were to one. So we're getting closer if we can increase that pasture supply. Now in the East region, about 20% of our farms uh, either have uh, grazed cropland, uh, have some permanent hayland, uh, may not have a fence around it, but that's where they always make their hay, or um, or they have uh, grazed woodland. And there's lots of different uh, views we could take on that. Uh, sometimes there's some significant pasture production there, and sometimes there's not, depending on the situation. So uh, about 20% of the farms have one of those situations. So maybe we would be able to go get some more pasture. Um, let's say that's, uh, that's the case here. Um, we know we're overstocked, so we're, we're going to either increase pasture acres or decrease cow herd size. But this person said, well, there's no way I'm selling any animals. You know, um, I need all the income I can get. Well, how many acres would they need? The great thing about this equation is, is we can solve for the question mark. We can actually find out, well, how many acres do we need? So uh, uh, I have to have a calculator, but if you're good at math, maybe you can do that in your head, but, but I can't. But uh, when we solve that, we find out that the question mark would have equaled 58 acres. So this person's going to have to get 17 more acres. They had 41, but they're going to need 58 just to reach a balance of 1. Okay? So if we've, if we've reached a balance of 1, are we done? No, no we're not because there's still going to be times where there's not enough pasture. So we're either going to have to feed the hay we've made here if it wasn't too steep to make hay on, or we're going to have to uh, find some other source, take them off the pasture, feed them hay that we bought. Um, we're going to have to supply those animals feed somehow during that hot dry time. Um, if, if we're not experiencing a, a hot dry period in in some parts of the East region, uh, then there may be a possibility we can do a better job of, uh, of being able to feed those animals with, with a forage animal balance of just one. Um, here's our problem, of course, as we said earlier, during these uh, seven months of our grazing season, we would have to average 860 pounds, that's about four-tenths of a ton um, per month. And uh, we, we get that for some months, but here again, we've got some months where we're, we're not going to have four tenths of a ton. And so we have to provide feed some other way. So um, we talked about stocking rate earlier, and I wanted to mention that here. Uh, we got 23 cows. If we were able to get our 58 acres here, that's about 2.5 acres per cow. Now, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions uh, over the years, especially when there's producers uh, where I'm doing a presentation or where we're doing training, and they'll say, well, can't you get, uh, uh, with really good rotation or grazing, just a one acre per cow-calf pair? Well, you, you really can't. If, if you use this formula that we've shown you and go through the calculations, you're going to find that it's going to take um, – uh, consistently five and a half or six tons per acre of pasture growth um, every year to, to be able to have one beef cow and her calf during the grazing season on, on one acre. I've been on very few farms that can do that. I've been on a few that do, um, but it, they do it with some very excellent management. But uh, definitely for the vast majority of our beef cow calf operations, uh, they're not going to be able to have that kind of production. So they're going to need, uh, as we saw, we're still going to fall short during the dry time if they had two and a half acres per cow. And so, uh, what a few grazing specialists have, have told me that they do is they shoot for, uh, uh, 1.5 grazing, uh, uh, forage animal balance. And so if we solved for 1.5 here, the question mark would need to equal 87 acres, okay? And and uh, a lot of people hear that, that number. It's like, well, 
gee, Kevin, I only got 23 cows, <laughs> and you want me to have 80 acres to, to graze them on. So, um, you know, that, that that's hard for a lot of people to swallow. But if we can get them to a balance of one and feed some hay during that dry time, that we've come a long way to protecting those resources. Um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to mention there are some people that use that uh, when they're working with producers. If we did that, we'd have 3.8 acres per cow. Okay? Yes. So, Kevin, there's a couple questions that's come in. And, uh, okay. Uh, uh, the first one is a simple one. Uh, do we have any tools that do these calculations for us? We sure do. And and I purposely wasn't mentioning them up till now. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that. No, that's okay. This, this is good. This came perfect. Um, we have uh, sea graze, which is used a lot in the east region, especially in the southeast. Uh, good program, really good program developed by uh, Dr. Jim Green and others. Uh, that's a great program to help help calculate the forage animal balance for you. Um, there's also uh, GSAT, which is a program mainly used out west. Some Midwestern states uh, use it also. Uh, it'll do those calculations for you. And I've found, um, just looking on my own, and I'm sure I missed some, David, but, but I found 16 different state spreadsheets that do this. Some are very elaborate. Some are very basic. Uh, the math behind them is all the same. It's just how they're presented. Um, but they, they will do those, those calculations for you. And, and one of the things we were asked for to do this presentation, David, by the state grazing specialists that talked to us about this, is they wanted their people to know what goes on behind those programs. Um, unfortunately, we've had a lot of turnover, a lot of retirements in NRCS and all of our states. And sometimes our new employees just, through no fault of their own, they just don't have any background in uh, animals or grazing. And so sometimes uh, just through uh, not having enough knowledge, not, not on purpose, some people are putting bad information in those software programs. And so therefore you get bad information out. And so we want people to try to begin to understand what's behind those, those programs. That's an excellent question, though. Okay, let me before I ask my next question that came in. Uh, I just want to—I'm getting a lot of questions about being able to print this uh, presentation out, at which you can. There's a should be an icon down in the right-hand corner of your screen, and if you're not seeing it, you just need to hit your escape key, and you're probably on full screen mode, and you should see it then, and you can print it to a PDF. Also, this will be available for replay uh, probably first next week off of the Science and Technology Training Library. And we also make a scripted, Kevin's going to a lot of trouble to script this for you all, a uh, copy of the presentation, the actual PowerPoint, so you can actually go out and give this presentation when you get done. Now, Kevin, uh, this is my question. The others came in. Why can't we just grow better forage? And does that, can we, if we grow better forage, can we reduce the number of acres needed? You can. You can. But, but here's my, that's a great question. Here's my, my word of caution, because I've heard a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, instead of three ton, what if I could grow that six ton I mentioned earlier? Well, you can't get there overnight. Uh, we have to change management. We have to distribute the manure, the nutrients much better. Uh, those plants are, are starving right now because of too short of roots, uh, not enough natural fertility, uh, you know, 70 to 90 percent of what what uh, a cow will take in in nutrients it puts right back out on the pasture and so that's real really good question we can get there but it's going to take good management for a few years to see those yields come up and then you actually can do a little less uh, acres um, and so you'll, you'll see production increase uh, and so that, that that's a good point very good question okay um, Speaking about that, um, this DVD that David talked to you about at the beginning, uh, J.B. Daniel and, and uh, his his group there in Virginia and RCS just did a fantastic job on uh, presenting this. And uh, uh, I'm sure the 
the first part, successful no teller farmers tell their stories, is great too. But I, quite frankly, I haven't ever watched that one. I've just watched the successful grazers tell their stories, and that's excellent. Uh, I've actually shown that at a couple of trainings, and so uh, you will hear these these uh, producers tell their stories, and they actually talk about how many paddocks they have, how many cows, um, and the, all those kinds of things. And they actually, uh, if you watch those DVDs, you can actually do a quick calculation in your head of their stocking rate, and what you find that a lot of those guys are two and a half to four acres per cow. And so it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, I hadn't, before I started putting together this presentation, I hadn't seen the DVD, so um, I, I was pleasantly surprised to, to hear that I'm kind of on track with what these people did. So uh, that that's a great DVD. Uh, every every state grazing specialist, I think, uh, was sent one of these, David. So. Uh, if or it's sent to your state office if, if you can't find one let us know and uh, we will get you one um, now there's a very limited supply because we did send out so many uh, out there across the country but but we'll do our best to get you one or burn you a copy or something okay so now now I'm going to try to do just a little bit of what what I do uh, what Michael Hall and I do when we, we go out on a farm, uh, and again, I wish I was a whiz at math in my head, and I'm not, so I usually take a calculator. But, but here's kind of some things I would do. During the inventory, uh, these are actually averages from the northeast um, part of the region. Uh, I got 16 cows weigh 1,200 pounds. I got 26 acres, again, that, that averages that 6,000 pounds per acre. And uh, 160 day growing season, we'll say, grazing season. So um, once I find that out during the inventory, while I'm walking around with the producer, uh, and I don't multitask real well, but I try to pay attention, of course, to what the producer is telling me, but maybe also writing some things down. So, so if I got 16 cows and they weigh 1,200 pounds, um, I try to multiply that in my head. Um, and uh trying to remember what what I came up with there, 1,200. This is where you need your calculators, those of you that are viewing. So if you take 1,200 times 16, get 19,200 if I did my calculation right. Um, okay, and then uh, that's, that's what that herd needs per day, right? So... Um, Oh, hang on, hang on. 36 pounds, I got ahead of myself. 3%, remember, times the 1,200-pound cow is 36 pounds. Now I want to take that times the 16 cows. See, I got ahead of myself. 576 pounds per day, okay, that that 16-cow herd needs. So then I take that times 160 days of grazing, and I get 92,160, okay? So sometimes I'm trying to do that in my head, um, you know, and I've, I've done that before where I'd, I'll, I'll start rounding, and I want to be conservative when I do that, so I might have said, okay, let's just say they need 100,000 uh, pounds of dry matter uh, for the grazing season. So then, in my head, I'm trying to say, well, he says he's got 26 acres of pasture, um, 6,000 pounds, uh, 6, 6, 36, uh, 2 times 6 is 12, 13, 14, 15, about 156,000 pounds of the pasture supply. Now, I'm not done, am I? i got to take that times the utilization rate of 30. So, let's see. Well, if, if I took uh, 30 percent is also 0.3. If I took 0.3 of uh, of 150, I can do that one. <laughs> that, that's 45, right? So uh, um, again, I'm I'm going to be estimating a little low. That's okay because I'm being conservative. So I'd say okay, 45,000 pounds of pasture supply. So 
here's here's what that looks like when we put this back into our formula. You can see that there. Hopefully, you're calculating the same thing. What what'd you get for an anim, an, forage animal balance on this? What's the question mark? Well, okay. So, um, you know, my estimates of 45 and 100,000 would have been little little worse than the actual, but the actual is 0.51. So we've got about half as much pasture as we really need here, David. And uh, so, back to the same old question. What do we do? Well, we either to increase pasture supply, uh, if we just don't want to keep feeding more hay, we have to find some more land. Or for animal demand, we need to, to decrease animals. Well, let's say... Um, we found a person that was willing to do that. It's like, you know, well, you know, if I could get my pastures in better shape, I, I believe you in our CS planner, uh, what you say will happen to my pastures if I really start um, managing them well. And so I, I'd be willing to get rid of a, a few cows. Okay, well, would you be willing to get rid of three and then do some rotational grazing? So we're going to say that that's what happens. So we're going to go to a 50% utilization rate, and he went from 16 cows to 13 cows. So go ahead and punch out that. 26 times 6,000 times 0.5, and we're going to divide that times 36 pounds times 13 cows times 160 days. And what do you know? Uh, we got 78,000 over 74,880. Uh, we're in, we're in balance. We're still probably going to have to do something during a, a hot dry spell uh, in midsummer, but uh, sure enough, we were able to get things in balance. So um, also, we're going to have available um, uh, people. Uh, I, I was trying to put it together today, and I ran out of time because I've I've been traveling a lot lately. Got back. Uh, last night, actually, um, but we're going to have some handouts, uh, as do a lot of these spreadsheets. A lot of these programs also have a, a quick way to figure out how many paddocks I need, what, how to size the paddock, all those kinds of things. Um, we're going to have that available also, but I just wanted to show you that this first and most important thing you need to do is to figure out the forage animal balance. There's, there's no use figuring out paddock size if they don't have enough acres no matter what you do, um, or paddock number. Um, so uh, figuring out that forage animal balance and then, then what that producer is willing to do as far as how often they're willing to move those animals, uh, in, in this case a beef cow calf operation, then that's going to decide what you can shoot for for utilization rates and then then that'll tell you paddock sizes and paddock numbers you can shoot for. So I, I know we just had a, um, a little less than an hour here to go over this stuff, but um, and it will be available and my scripted notes um, as well as some other information. So hopefully this will be something you can refer to, and hopefully now you know um, what the, the the numbers mean behind those programs that are out there that, that people are using. So with that, David, uh, I guess I'm ready for some questions. Okay, uh, operator, if you want to open the phone lines up, I've got a, uh, several questions here that I can start with. But again, uh, if anybody wants to ask Kevin a question, uh, go ahead and you can either hit star one and go in through the operator or you can continue to t uh, type them in. And I've got uh, uh, several questions, and I'll start with one, uh, Kevin, that was asked a little bit ago. Someone wants to know if we've got 365 days in a year, how come we're only calculating 210 days as grazing? Well, the the forage is only going to be growing uh, dur during the grazing season or growing season. So um, now, you know, obviously things are a little uh, different. Uh, in the deep south, where they can grow forage 365 days a year, um, uh, even they have their times where there's there's kind of a, a lax time between forages. Um, but uh, for most of the east region, 
um, between uh, killing frost and, and uh, first killing frost and and uh, at the beginning of the year that the last killing frost that that's that's typically what we call our growing season, our grazing season, and that's when forages are going to be growing the most. So um, most people um, will figure that for the grazing season, what the forage animal balance is, and and uh, uh, another factor there is uh, I didn't get into dairies very much, um, but dairies usually feed some some supplemental concentrate of some type. Uh, or, a, or a total mixed ration, so those animals are getting other feed. But I wanted to stick with the beef cow calf and say they're getting everything from the pasture so that uh, people could learn how to figure out these, these basic things. But that's why we only do it uh, for, for the days of the grazing season, because once those forages quit growing, then uh, uh, once they're eaten off, then there's not going to be anything back there again. Well, as a follow-up question came in, what, what's this about stockpiling? Is there any way you can extend the grazing season? Yeah, a absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to do that uh, in our grazing management series. We're going to talk about uh, stockpiling. But, yes, that, that's where you would stop uh, uh, grazing a portion of the pasture. Uh, I'm trying to think uh, uh, for, for – uh, a lot of part of the East region that that'd be sometime between uh, August and September, depending on where you're at, and uh, you would let that that forage accumulate. Um, it wouldn't get too mature. The the timing there is kind of the key, but you could let that forage accumulate, and then uh, now they're going to have to be feeding hay if you're short on acres uh, at that time um, to let that happen. Uh, but um, and and you should do that hay feeding in a small area and not ruin all the pasture, of course. But anyway, you you would let that accumulate, and then uh, after some killing frosts, uh, um, that's when people will come back in, and and they'll graze that, they'll strip graze that, and sometimes they can get as many as uh, three or four months, uh, depending on how much area you set aside of of grazing into that fall and early winter time of year. Good okay. question. Uh, Operator, do we have anybody uh, phone in a question? We do. We do have a question online, sir. One moment. Okay. Well, go ahead. Mr. Lopento, your line is open. Okay. Uh, it was just more of a comment than anything. Back on one of your first slides where you showed the forage animal balance, before you send out the presentation, you had a, an error there on the top uh -oh. for, the, for the supply. Uh, you actually had the herd intake number up there, the 828. Oh, okay. So your math looks really odd there. Yes. It was Thank just a comment. you very much. Oh, you're because, welcome. Uh, um, yes, that that in my hurry putting this together this morning, <laughs> the, there's an error. So thank you for pointing that out. We'll correct that before we post this. You're welcome. And I, th I think that points out why you should have a pen and paper with you, Kevin, when you're doing these things. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, let me ask another question before we go back to the audio. Someone wants to know where they can get more information about forage suitability groups. Okay, forage suitability groups, uh, those have to be developed by uh, uh, NRCS at, at the state level. And so um, once they're done and posted, there, there aren't very many done in the East Region yet, but we have a lot of states working on them right now. Um, so in the near future, uh, there'll be some posted, and then they'll be available through Web Soil Survey. And uh, uh, for people that have ever used our Web Soil Survey site, uh, you can now find information on ecological site descriptions. Uh, a lot of those have been done in some of the western states. But in the near future, you're going to be able to find uh, forage suitability group information. And it takes a while to, to develop that good information, uh, like I was saying at the beginning, so that we have a good estimation of how much forage we can expect on an area, uh, on a certain soil, and on a certain landscape position, and that kind of thing. Okay. Operator, do we have any more uh, questions? I'm showing up for the questions. Okay. Well, I've got I got a number of ones here. I've got a, somebody just sent in a comment that you might say yay or nay to, but just says from their experience, they like to add about 300 pounds onto the 1,200 pounds for each uh, cow to account for what the calf 
consumes uh, good grazing genetics. Uh, calves can eat a lot of grass, and of course, the amount increases as they get bigger. Is that a yeah? Nothing, nothing wrong with doing that. Um, what what some people have done is is they'll use 2.5 or 2.6 percent instead of three uh, for figuring out uh, uh, how much intake that cow is going to have, and so um, a lot of people use the three percent. Uh, to kind of make up for that difference of, because uh, cause as that cow um, goes to um, past peak lactation, uh, I'm thinking of a spring calving uh, situation, as that cow goes past peak lactation, uh, her intake will actually drop off quite a bit, uh, all the way, sometimes even um, it can get down there close to 2%. Uh, as the calf is going from just milk to eating some grass and it increasing. So it uh, uh, makes no difference how you do it. I'm just glad people are accounting for it. So uh, yeah. that's great. Uh, just they want to make sure are you using the same uh, units for animal demand as well as forage yield, and are they both uh, units based on dry matter? Yes. Yep. Yeah. The, the animal demand, we're talking about dry matter, and when we say um, that 6,000 pounds, we're talking 6,000 pounds of dry matter. Most of our grazing sticks that our NRCS people are using, uh, they worked with land-grant universities to develop those. And so uh, if it says that you're getting 400 pounds per inch, so 10 inches tall equals 4,000 pounds, that's 4,000 pounds of dry matter. So good point. Those those. We need to make sure uh, when we're doing our planning that we're talking about dry matter, both for supply and demand. Okay. Uh, and there's still another question is, someone wants to know, in your examples you provided, are you assuming that the excess of spring growth is harvested for summer feed or not? No, it, it's great if it can be. Um, some people will do that, but, but other people will, will also use a grazing management I've heard it called top grazing, uh, where we're putting the animals through really, really fast. Um, so maybe they'll only be a, a day in an area, and we've got those paddocks really small, so they'll kind of top it off and go through. Now, somebody has to be there uh, to move those cattle to make that happen, but um, but that is one way people do it, and, and they'll do that all the way until growth slows down. So you don't have to harvest it uh, mechanically, but some people do. Okay. Well, this question kind of goes along with that. It says, if you're going to rotate your pastures and provide longer rest periods, would not your yield increase potentially? Yes, it will. Again, going back to what I said earlier, that's a really good point. They will over time. Uh, if, if uh, like that picture I showed, you know, where the pasture's just been beat to death, uh, that pasture to switch to a, a system where the plants get rest and and um, manure nutrients are being spread good and and uh, the plants are still left with three or four inches to to keep the roots alive. Um, in that situation, that's still going to take that farm uh, two, three, four years to see things bounce back uh, to that greatly increased production. But yes, it will increase. Okay, and then uh, kind of a follow-up on that is uh, where can we get the the best yield information on our pasture productions? Usually, our land grant universities is a great place to start. Uh, that's where I usually try to start. Uh, in some states, unfortunately, because I've gone through this with some of our state grazing specialists, there really isn't much uh, from the land grants. And so then we're left with our old soil survey information, um, which something is better than nothing. Um, if nothing else, uh, if the farmer doesn't have an idea of how many tons of hay they've taken off an area of the pasture or on on soils very similar to that pasture, um, then th I've done this a couple of times where I've actually just uh, um, – tried to go over to the fence row <laughs> where the cattle couldn't reach uh, and and measure, try to get an idea of, of what the yield is. So you just have to do the best you can. But if you ever run into that in planning, 
uh, you can feel free to give Michael or I a call, and we'll, we'll help you with that. Okay. Yeah, uh, operator, is there anybody call in a question? I'm showing no questions. Okay. Well, I still got a few more. I got to ask you this one because this is my question. If I take 23 cows down to 20, is there any economic data? That doesn't seem like a very small percentage, and it seems like you could make up the difference by less production costs. Is there any economic data out there to support that that's a good thing to do? Yeah, th there's a little bit. Um, NC State uh, has done some of that work. Um, Madeline Ransom, our economist here, and I uh, did that economic uh, seminar webinar last summer, and uh, we actually took a look at um, – the cost of, of hay, um, how much more it, it cost to feed those animals um, because they were overstocked to begin with, and, and we actually looked at a real-life case study uh, in Virginia where by uh, destocking, they got rid of a few cows, and they went to uh, rotational grazing, how they actually made more money. And this, this, we're not talking about any kind of cost share here. We're just talking about the producer changing management. Uh, they actually made more money than they had with more animals and having to feed more hay, that kind of thing. So good question. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, got two or three more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap this thing up. We've got somebody out there doing some irrigation, and their question is, can these utilization rates be used on irrigated pastures, such as on the West Coast? West Coast, excuse me, what about rangeland? And can you comment on utilization rates uh, changing uh, a little until you get to the two to four day grazing period? So, okay. I'll go back to your chart there. Yeah. Um, well, let, let's start out on, on irrigation. Uh, there's, I don't know a lot about uh, irrigation on the West Coast and, and, and certainly not on range. I don't know. Um, obviously, anything we can do to get increased growth and then using management that won't damage those plants when we do our grazing uh, is going to be good. Um, so uh, I do know of a couple of, of farms uh, that are doing irrigation in the east, and they have greatly increased production. Um, as far as utilization and how they do their management, uh, about the best they can do on on once a day moves uh, with either beef or dairy. Um, in fact, some dairies doing every every six hours. Uh, I've I've seen 75, 80, and 85 percent figures utilization. Now that's the exception. Uh, I don't think most people can do that, um, and especially without irrigation because your production has to be really good and it has to be, that plant has to be growing even during that, that dry time. Obviously, that's what irrigation's for. But uh, as far as you, your utilization, that's all about how many animals are on how big of an area for how long. So that really shouldn't, our management decides utilization and our irrigation really helps with production. Okay. Uh, to kind of go along with that increasing utilization, how does uh, substituting warm season grasses uh, as part of the uh, pasture acre affect carrying capacity? That, that, that's a great question. And uh, University of Tennessee, I know, has gotten a grant, and I know NC State's starting to do some work with that, where uh, they're taking about a third of the acreage, I believe it is, and putting that into warm season grasses specifically to fill that hot, dry time. Warm season grasses will still grow. They're, they're deeper rooted. Um, they do quite well in that hot, hot, dry period if they're well established before that hot, dry period happens. Um, the, the difference is as we manage warm seasons differently. We don't want to graze them down to three inches every time. Uh, their, their growing points higher that they, we, we just need to leave those, those plants taller. So, we wouldn't start grazing, uh, for instance, eastern gamma grass till probably 24 inches tall, and we'd want to stop at 10 inches tall. So we manage them different. And we've had some trials on some farms where the farmers, they really wanted to try it, but they managed the warm seasons just like they did the cool seasons, and they grazed them too short. 
So uh, that's the challenge. Is uh, I, I think that can work, but we've really got to train uh, uh, our our livestock producers to be able to handle that. Okay. And two more questions. Question about if forage animal balance is one, what will crop nutrient balance be? I'm not quite sure I understand that. Well, it, it is true that if we're only recycling 70 to 90 percent of the nutrients back, you know, obviously when that calf leaves, or if we're talking about a dairy, when that milk leaves, uh, or or lambs or whatever we're talking about, then some nutrients leave. So it is true over time um, that that we can deplete nutrients. Although, <laughs> as we know, uh, Ray Archuleta here and the, and the Soil Health and Sustainability Team uh, will tell us that there's actually some research out there that shows that uh, it's amazing uh, when that soil is fully functioning uh, how how little nutrients you need for for many years, and so um, the the jury's still out as far as unfortunately we don't have much of that information on pasture, um, but but anyway you're right over time we will lose a little, and uh, uh, so but it's easy to to uh, get those nutrients on there. Uh, we can supply nitrogen through having lots of legumes in the stand and that kind of thing. So uh, there's lots of ways to do it, and we're, and we're not talking about the big expense of, of uh, like you think of cropland, having to add nutrients back. So you're, you're saying it is economical to fertilize paddocks or some of the paddocks to get more production and increase? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's data by several land grants that shows that it is, uh, but it doesn't take very much to get that. Um, and, and in 2008, with uh, fertilizer, went over a thousand dollars a ton and we may be headed there again pretty soon we don't want to uh, we'll lose money if we if we apply very much um, especially more than that's needed okay Kevin well listen I'm going to uh, cut the questions off and compliment you on an excellent job uh, I don't know how many of you out there have ever done a webinar but when you're sitting across the table and staring at my face it's not a pleasant sight and it's not necessarily an easy thing to do and I think Kevin did a very good job and spontaneously asking questions and the like. So uh, to close out the webinar, I want to just to remind folks, uh, our next two webinars in the series are, uh, again, on uh, Wednesday, March 28th, is Nutrient Management and No-Till Cropping Systems. Uh, Gene Hardy, our, our regional agronomist, will be making probably his swan song presentation. Gene's getting ready to retire. And we're all deeply uh, trying to bribe and twist his arm to get him to stay around. But when you get 42 years in, I guess it gets you time to let him go. So we appreciate Gene's effort, and hopefully we'll get a good turnout for that. Uh, then the next in the organic series is understanding organic agriculture, organic pasture management. So it's going to build on what Kevin said and talk about some of the nuances that the National Organic Program would require. Uh, as w with all of our present webinars, they're all available for replay. I, I, sorry about the print function, but you will be able to get a copy of Kevin's presentation off of the Science and Technology Training Library, uh, as you see the uh, information being provided there. Again, if you've got CCA credits, you need to print the form out, get it to uh, Holly Kirkendall, and she will see that that gets taken care of. We are, uh, I don't know if the guy's sick over there or what, but there we are having a little struggle getting some communications with NC, uh, uh, the person here in North Carolina we're working with, but they will honor all your CCA credit requests. And in fact, Kevin, if you got any closing comments, we'll... I don't. Thanks, David, for you did a great job moderating, and I, I thanks, thank everybody for their great questions and comments. Uh, uh, really appreciate your participation. Okay, and with that, we'll let everybody go, and hopefully you'll have a good rest of the day. Take care. This will conclude today's conference.